Welcome everybody to today's FTTT GOES Applications webinar. Today we're pleased to have Bill Line from the Weather Service Office in Pueblo, Colorado, uh, leading today's presentation, presentation, which is titled Modifying RGB Imagery on the Fly in AWIPS. If you can go to the next slide, Bill. Uh, just some protocol to go over uh, first. A reminder that all of these uh, webinars are recorded and made available for viewing at any time on the visit web pages at the URL shown here. Uh, at the end, we'll have a Q&A uh, for discussion. And also, we're looking for volunteers. So if you have any ideas in mind, uh, just cont contact either myself, Dan Bikus, or Scott Lindstrom. Next. Uh, some protocol to go over. We'll have about 20 minutes uh, for Bill to present, and uh, we'll have a Q&A period over the phone immediately afterwards, and we will be done um, within 30 minutes, so we'll be done by 18.30. Remember, do not press hold, and also remember to mute when you're not speaking. So at this point, I'll turn it over to Bill. All right. Thank you, Dan, for that introduction, and thanks, everyone, for listening today. And this, the idea for giving this talk in this uh, venue came from the satellite applications workshop that took place in late uh, July. Um, there were several presentations by forecasters, including myself, who discussed the benefits to uh, modifying RGB imagery in AWIPS for certain uh, situations, for certain RGBs. And we figured if forecasters are doing this, it, it would be a great idea to actually develop some sort of training or uh, walkthrough guide as to uh, how exactly uh, forecasters can do this and when they should do it and maybe when they should not do it. Um, so I, I wrote a blog post recently on the Satellite Liaison blog that's linked at the bottom of the screen um, that kind of goes through that and then this talk uh, will we'll do the same. So uh, we're all familiar with uh, the RGBs in, in AWIPS. Um, you could see all of them listed on this uh, slide. Uh, there are several categories. The simple RGBs uh, utilize um, single band imagery for each of the three uh, red, green, and blue components. Um, for me, uh, one of my favorite RGBs to use uh, for a variety of um, uh, weather uh, situations is the day cloud phase distinction RGB, and I'll discuss that a few times in this presentation. Uh, there are also the advanced RGBs, which uh, utilize a, a channel difference for at least one of the components. Uh, so they, they, they're in the advanced category. And from this list, one of my other favorite RGBs is the nighttime microphysics RGB, obviously for analyzing clouds um, at night. Then there's a few old RGBs, and then um, there's just some, some RGBs I like to, some, some test RGBs I've created. So looking uh, just specifically at the day cloud distinction or day cloud phase distinction RGB, uh, this is the recipe from from the quick guide. Again, all these quick guides are available on the store VLAB page, and they're very helpful. So you can see just quickly uh, this example. You have the red, green, and blue components to the RGB. Um, uh, each of the colors has a single band. Um, that's, that's applied to it. Um, for example, in this case, the green green uh, component or green gun to this RGB is the 0 0.64 micrometer visible uh, channel, channel 2. And each of the components are applied a range. So for this RGB, uh, the default range for the uh, green component is 0 to 78% uh, percent, uh, for the albedo. And you can see the blue component uh, has, has a range, and the red component has a range. And these are set, um, you know, based on past experience by whoever developed the RGB. I think this RGB was developed by JMA. Um, so they developed these threshold set channels chosen for a reason. Um, and you could see uh, what this RGB gives you compared to just single band visible imagery alone is a clear distinction between various uh, cloud types as well as between uh, clouds and snow. Very helpful for identifying uh, low clouds over snow compared to just the visible alone. So uh, there uh, was a recent update 
in ALIPS to the RGB computation method, and uh, this has also allowed us to, uh, I think that change was about a year ago, uh, we are also now able to see um, when we, uh, uh, the, the composite options, um, when we load that option, you could uh, get more information about the RGB and actually edit uh, the RGB. And how you do that is by right-clicking on the RGB from the product legend in the bottom of your um, D2D screen. Right-click and hold, and then you select the composite options uh, text, and that'll load the composite options GUI. And again, this was new about a year ago. You could see uh, for that RGB, as I talked about on the previous slide, you could see uh, the max, the min, and the gamma for each of the three uh, color components for the red, green, and blue. And you could uh, adjust those thresholds by either dragging those uh, color bar, the bars, um, left or right. Uh, you can manually edit the numbers uh, as well. And actually, as you drag those bars and edit the numbers, the RGB will change uh, in your screen on the fly uh, before you even select OK, so that's pretty neat. Uh, there's also the gamma options, and I, in a nutshell, basically what the gamma does is if you uh, lower the threshold for the gamma below one, uh, you'll add more weight to that um, color component, so that color is going to uh, have more um, value towards it. If you raise the gamma, it will have a little less weight towards that towards that. Uh, that data color. So uh, that, that's loading the composite options. Then on the right, you can see uh, if you turn on sampling in your ALIPS D2D uh, and get a readout of the RGB, uh, you get a lot of information, including you know, what channel or channel difference is applied to that color component, um, as well as the exact value of that uh, single band or channel difference, as well as the percentage uh, how, how much red, how much green, how much blue do we have? So if you're reaching your max value for that single band, um, that would uh, show as 100%, so you have uh, the maximum amount of that color. If, if you are in the minimum or below the minimum, you're going to be 0%, so you're not going to contribute any of that color. So in this case, you could see that uh, for the red and blue components, you're only 30 to 40%. Uh, of, of that threshold towards the maximum, uh, while the green component is closer to the max, so 65%. So th those clouds there then appear uh, more, of, more of a green. So moving on to the next slide, why would we want to make these modifications? Again, those thresholds were sent for, set for a reason. Why would we ever want to change them? Well, there are about uh, or three situations I'll talk about in this, this uh, discussion. Uh, that, that I think it is useful to make some changes. And I, I will stress uh, to make these changes on the fly, and I'll talk about throughout this talk why you would want to do that. The first, and I think most common situation you would make a modification to an RGB is uh, when you, your RGB includes single band vis or near IR components, so they have reflectance, they depend on sunlight. Um, when you're using these RGBs in low light situations, they're going to look at little different features. It might be a little more difficult to detect, so it is useful to uh, modify the RGB. Um, for example, day cloud phase distinction, day snow fog, and the sandwich RGB are, are three uh, products you might want to do this for. What change would you make? Simply lowering the max values for the viz or near IR components, or um, adjust the gamma values downward. Uh, what would extend the use of the RGB earlier in the morning when you have less light as well as uh, later in the evening when you have less light. So looking at a few examples of how an, a, an adjustment like this would work, you're looking at the day cloud phase distinction RGB uh, during the morning, looking at low clouds and fog over the San Luis Valley in southern Colorado, northern New Mexico. Um, you can see on the left, looking at the default RGB on the right, the modified RGB. The default appears dark, especially early in the loop, a lot more difficult to detect some of those cloud features, especially further west in the uh, upper Rio Grande River Valley. By lowering the max component of the green and blue uh, uh, single band, so the green is uh, 0.64, again, the max 
by default is 78%. Early in the morning, uh, the values for reflectance down there might be only uh, 20, 30%. So if we lower the green component maybe down to 50 or 40%, and then the, the blue as well, which is the snow ice uh, 1.6 micron channel, lower that maybe down to 30 or 40 uh, or 25, 30 uh, percent, will draw out those uh, low clouds a little more, increase your brightness, increase your contrast, making those features uh, easier to detect. And for most of these examples I'll show, I, I'm not going to give you exact thresholds to change it to, again, because it's really arbitrary. It's changing on the fly. These changes should take maybe 15 seconds to make while you're doing your work. And um, you, you make the change and maybe change it throughout the morning as the sunlight changes. Another example of uh, valley fog over Pennsylvania, New York in the morning. Again, on the left is your default table. Again, a lot more difficult to see the low clouds um, in, the, in the valleys, the fog in the valleys. Uh, but in this case, in the middle example, again, similar to the previous case, we're lowering the maximum values for the green and the blue components um, so that um, the contribution is uh, closer um, to 100%. Um, in this case, I think lowered the green to maybe 30 and the blue to maybe 15. That drew out that fog nicely. Um, alternatively, as I mentioned, you could adjust the gamma value. Uh, so on the right, I only adjusted the gamma for the same case uh, down to 0 0.5 for both the green and blue components. And you could see similarly it did draw out the fog. And you could do another case where you adjust both the max for the green and the blue and the gammas. Um, but um, I think for, for these low light cases, uh, I, have, I do find just adjusting the max for the green and the blue down and don't even touch the gammas. But the gamma is a, another uh, option for you. So you can see we're really not changing the meaning of the colors. If you look at the quick guide, or what, what the various colors mean, we're not changing the meaning. We're just making uh, this RGB a little more useful a little uh, earlier in the morning. Here's a different RGB, and this comes as an example from the satellite applications workshop. Um, the, some of the folks up in the northern U.S. Plains have found use in the day snow fog RGB for identifying blowing snow events. And um, in, in the link there and at the workshop, you could see that uh, the, the process of making those adjustments and, and uh, what it gives you uh, as you lose light um, show the value of making those adjustments to be able to identify areas of blowing sm snow um, either earlier in the morning or in this case uh, later at night. So moving on to the final low light example, this for the sandwich RGB. Uh, you may notice early in the morning or as you get towards the evening monitoring convection, the scene becomes pretty dark. You're losing contrast. It's a little more difficult to see features in, in this RGB. Um, I found value in decreasing uh, the red, green, and blue uh, max values equally, as well as decreasing the gammas equally uh, slightly. This RGB is a little different in that you're not seeing, you know, single band or band differences for the contributions. It's a little more complicated RGB. Uh, so when you're adjusting this one in low light situations, you should be changing the max maxes for all three components equally, as well as the gammas equally, to maintain uh, the main main idea behind the RGB. The colors mean mean the same thing but just make it brighter and increase contrast so you could uh, identify uh, features easily. Moving on to the next uh, reason we would adjust an RGB. Um, this is mainly focusing on the day cloud phase distinction RGB, but it may apply to some other RGBs. It's when you have components saturating. And usually this is, it would be the vis or the near IR component saturating. Uh, that, that causes you to lose the detail in, in those bands. So what we would want to do to increase the usefulness in these situations is to raise the max values for those uh, components. So here's an example from uh, central Colorado looking at convective initiation. Uh, during the early afternoon, you have this time of year in early August high sun angle. 
uh, your clouds are going to have a very high albedo. And as I mentioned, the green component here has a 78% albedo for its maximum value for that component. So we're going to exceed that pretty easily with clouds. So if you want to use this RGB to monitor the development of Q, um, th there's been some RGBs, maybe a webinar on using this RGB for um, identifying convective initiation. As you go from the aqua color or the cyan color to the greens, you're getting glaciation because you're losing your blue component. And then as you go from the green to the yellow uh, or the very bright green or orange, uh, that means your, your green is still high, your blue is low, but you're adding that red component, uh, which is telling you that, that that cloud is cooling and initiating. So, but if you want to use it in this situation, especially during the summertime, again, your, your reflectance or albedos are going to really exceed those thresholds for the green and probably blue components as well. So again, on the fly, if you raise the max values for the green and probably blue, uh, you're going to um, be able to um, not, you're, you're going to stay within the thresholds then so that it doesn't saturate. Like you see on the left with the default settings, you're saturating. You're not seeing any of the detail that the visible or near IR channel is giving you. But on the right, when you raise those max thresholds, uh, you can see the detail in the clouds. And here's just uh, an example, at least for this case, the changes that were made to uh, make it so you're not saturating. Uh, the green was increased to 120 um, percent, while the blue uh, albedo was maximum was uh, increased to 70. So, really, again, you're not changing the meaning of the colors, but uh, they, the meaning may change slightly. But still, you're looking for the transitions in, in this type of situations from the cyan to the green to the yellow or orange, and that that remains the same. But you're simply changing the fact that you're no longer saturating. You're able to see those details in the clouds. And that is increasing the value of the RGB. And just one more example with this RGB, looking at a mature uh, area of convection, uh, if you're using this RGB you know, post-convective initiation, those cloud tops are, again, going to saturate in your visible and possibly near IR components. So, Again, increasing the max for that green component would allow you to see the details in the cloud top without really changing the meaning of the RGB elsewhere. The final uh, reason we would um, maybe adjust on the, R the RGB on the fly that I'll mention today is uh, a few of the RGBs with the 10.3 micron uh, band. Um, those RGBs, particularly day cloud phase distinction, nighttime microphysics, looking at them in cold air masses, uh, the, the meanings of the colors versus what you would expect in a warmer air mass uh, do change. So you may recall over the last couple of years using these RGBs, the, the, the clouds for low clouds, um, for, for mid-level clouds, the, the colors for those types of clouds may be a little different because you have a, a colder air mass, so you're going to have a less of a red red contribution or blue contribution or whatever uh, 10.3 is contributing to. So basically what you do is uh, adjust the max and min bounds uh, to uh, more so center around uh, the 10.3 micron brightness temperature. So just let's quick look at a couple examples for this um, adjustment. The day cloud phase distinction RGB over Alaska in November. Um, you can see on the left, it looks a little different than what you'd expect from this RGB for various cloud layers um, compared to um, during, during a warm, warm, in a warm air mass. So in this case, my lower sun angle, uh, so our vis and near our components are pretty low. So those, the max values for those, you would adjust down a little bit. Uh, but the main change here is uh, decreasing the range of the IR window component due to the cooler brightness temperatures. So on the left, we're very cold, so in this case, closer to the minus 53 and a half C maximum threshold for this RGB. It's reversed. Um, if we maybe adjust that range to uh, zero to 60, minus 60, or minus 10 to minus 70, um, we're closer to what we would expect from this RGB, and that, that modification can be seen on the right, whereas the, the low clouds are more of the, the aqua or cyan color we're familiar with. Uh, the snow is 
a, a more of a green, and then the high clouds are a red, reddish uh, color. A similar adjustment might be made for the uh, nighttime microphysics RGB in a cold air mask. Uh, these are actually both from today on the left. Uh, this morning over uh, Colorado, Kansas, you can see what you know. Colors are what you'd expect from the nighttime microphysics RGB. Low clouds, fog, or maybe a, a bluish aqua, maybe cyan color. There in Kansas, the mid-level clouds are um, over in Colorado. Then the high clouds, uh, you can see there in the reds as well. Uh, in the cold air mass, it's a lot different um, than what you'd expect, and I think some of the training does address uh, the difference. But if you make an adjustment to the blue component, which is the 10.3 micron channel, maybe adjust the range um, instead of minus instead of minus 29 to minus 19, maybe change it to minus uh, 50 to, to zero. I think that's what I did here. And making that change, then you can see that the area of low clouds and fog, the land, the mid-level high clouds are a little closer to what you'd expect during the warm season. Again, this change isn't really necessary because you might be able to just adjust your thinking of what various cloud features uh, look like um, by season. Uh, but if you if you want to, you know, make it look like what you're used to looking at in the warm air mass, uh, you might adjust uh, that 10.3 micron channel range, both the max and the min. Uh, you might you can also adjust the gamma for this little uh, to to um, adjust the weight. So that's all I have for examples, as I kind of stressed throughout this presentation. I think it's best to make these changes on the fly. Always start with the default uh, settings so you know kind of what, what you're coming from. And these changes are quick and very easy. Again, you're doing it on the fly, maybe 15 seconds to make a quick change. Similarly, for the cases I presented, especially the, the, um, the saturation, uh, of the visible components and the low light examples, probably not a good idea to save the procedures or share them because it's going to, the degree to which you'll make the change will constantly be changing from time of day to uh, what season you're in, what the sun angle, to what location you're in, to the type of weather you're looking at. It's always going to be different. So I wouldn't really see a point in saving in our, in saving a procedure because you're going to end up saving a million procedures because there's going to be uh, a ton of situations, different situations that you would want an adjustment for. And if, then if you're sharing that procedure, it could cause uh, confusion, misinterpretation, and misuse of the RGB. And I, I haven't really found reason to make adjustments to the more co complicated advanced RGBs, including the difference components or the water vapor. Um, those really shouldn't change too much from uh, season to season, time to time. So if you are changing those, you're probably changing the meaning of the RGB, which again could lead to confusion and misuse. Um, I say all this, uh, but if the changes you're making result uh, in, in, cha in um, changes that are documented and they stand the test of time, um, maybe that's a case where you would save it and share it. If it's kind of more of a permanent change, you know the difference it makes. Uh, compared to the default RGB. But again, for the most part, probably shouldn't be saving and sharing these. Instead, you should be sharing the, the practice of making these RGB modifications and how you would adjust an RGB in a certain situation. Uh, so that uh, is the extent of this discussion. I'm happy to take questions. Um, again, some examples of this are available on the Satellite Liaison blog, and then, of course, this webinar will be saved uh, for folks to access. Thank you. Okay, any questions for Bill? Okay, well, I'm not hearing any <clears throat> questions, so at this point, I'll thank uh, Bill. And um, just a reminder that this will be posted onto the uh, visit web pages for your viewing uh, at any time. Thanks, everybody, and have a great day.